I was wrestling with it over the last like two or three weeks when, when Brad was saying, uh, I'm going to be preaching on my birthday, which is a big gift as well. And then I, I, I settled on this topic. It was during service one day. We were sitting here in church and it just popped into my heart, Slaves of Freedom. And it's a principle that um, has really helped me a lot experience the freedom that we have in Christ. And it's that same freedom that we have in Christ that I'd like to share with you this morning. And I know the title sounds a little bit like an oxymoron, like how can I be a slave to freedom? If I'm meant to be free, then I shouldn't be a slave. But it's, it's exactly that. It's, it's when we have the right mindset, the, a mindset where we realize that yes, we have freedom, but we willfully make ourselves slaves of Christ. Then we truly walk in freedom then we can maintain godly freedom in our lives. And that's just what I want to share with you today. But, but in order to really open it up, we have to first kind of think to ourselves, what is true freedom? How do we find this freedom? What do we need freedom from? Because oftentimes we sit and we think, well, I'm free. I'm okay. I live in a free country. I can do as I want to do, yes. But there's a big difference between our perspective in life and God's perspective in life. And if we truly want to live to please God, we've got to adopt, we've got to welcome God's perspective in life. And the verses that I want to share with you today, the first one comes out of Galatians 5 verse 1, and it says, Christ has liberated us to be free. And I think that's the primary thing. We need to understand, even as we shared communion this morning, that our freedom is in Christ. That Christ is the one who has set us free. You know, in, in the world that we live in today, um, so many of us, and I know I get caught up in it myself very often, we're seeking financial freedom. We're seeking the freedom to live the way that we want to live, to express ourselves in the way that we want to express ourselves. We're trying to find our own unique voices in this world. And oftentimes while we are seeking this freedom, these various forms of freedom, we are missing Christ. We are missing the fact that it is Christ who set us free. And that our true freedom essentially from all things is in Christ. And I'll carry on. It says, so stand firm then and don't submit again to a yoke of slavery. So now, yes, our freedom is in Christ. There's God's proactive worth the death of Christ on the cross that has set us free of all things. But there's also a reactive work from our side. And it's something I realized many, many uh, years ago. And it's something that I've taught a whole lot of people that had found themselves um, in the trap of addiction. Slaves to drugs. I said, what you submit yourself to is ultimately what you're going to become. So because we have freedom in Christ... We should willfully now submit ourselves to Him so that we can become like Christ. Because what we submit ourselves to, we ultimately become. A drug addict submits themselves to the use of drugs and eventually they become a drug addict. They can't live without the drugs. In the same essence, a thief first decides in their mind, I'm going to steal that one thing because that person doesn't need it as much as I do. They submit themselves to stealing and they end up becoming a thief and becoming a criminal. And that's what they get known by. So we've also got to realize that yes, there's a proactive part which God has accomplished 2,000 odd years ago on the cross. We've been set free. But how are we going to respond? What are we as Christians going to submit ourselves to? Because we should not submit ourselves again to that yoke of slavery. We should now submit ourselves to the freedom that Christ has purchased for us. And then the verse that ultimately opened up this principle, it's a little bit later on in Galatians 5. It's Galatians 5 verse 13 to 15. And it says, for you were called to be free. Only don't use this freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but serve one another with love. That's our ultimate calling, Christ. 
And it says why? Because love is the law. The law is fulfilled in love. In that one statement, love thy neighbor as you love yourself. In fact, we know that Christ went and raised the bar, didn't he? Because oftentimes us ourselves, we don't really know how to love ourselves. So the love's still going to be incomplete. And what did Christ say to his disciples? Love one another as I have loved you. So we can always turn to our example in Christ when we don't know. Love one another as I have loved you. And then it carries on. And this is also just one point that I want to iterate because the choice is ours. We've got that freedom now. We can choose how we're going to live truly. Not just physically but spiritually as well. But it says, watch out. Oh, but if you bite and devour one another, watch out. Or you will be consumed by one another. So we've got the choice to live in freedom. We've got the choice to live in slavery. But we do not have freedom from the consequence of our choices. You know, it's like I was mentioning it the other day. You oftentimes get these people who want to eat the butter. That's the culture we live in today. We want to eat the butter without churning the cream. You know, we want the best without putting in the work. And unfortunately, it doesn't work like that in the spiritual world with God and with most things in life. We've got to put in the work. We've got to be prepared to lay down our lives as Christ laid down his life. We've got to be prepared to put in the work. Because if we decide to live in sin, if we decide to break each other down, we are not going to be removed from the consequences of our sin, even though we have been redeemed by the blood of Christ. Those consequences are still going to come down upon us. And if we have been called into freedom, and we can live in freedom, is it not much better to walk in the consequences of freedom, in the consequences that love brings, rather than the consequences of this world? So what I want to start moving into now is the various things that we have freedom from. There's numerous amounts, but there's three that I want to focus on. And the very first one is freedom from sin. Um, and this is, this is a difficult one because, yes, we might not experience in this world um, total freedom from sin. Because we're born into it, it's ultimately how we grow up as sinners. Um, we're conditioned to, to think sinfully. And I, I oftentimes use the analogy of uh, uh, children when I talk about sin. And people, <laughs> I talk about children because I want to show you how we are sinners from birth. And how we have a natural tendency to gravitate towards the wrong things. If a child has eaten a sweet in their lives before and they've had that taste of sweetness... If you put broccoli in front of that child and you put the sweet in front of that child, which one are they going to choose? Oh, my Lord. Please take me to your child. <laughs> Show me how. <laughs> and <laughs> we all know consciously now as adults that broccoli is the far better choice. It's high in protein or high in protein, got good antioxidants, cleans out our system. But we gravitate towards the, we gravitate towards what is bad for us. Um, I did an exercise with my kids a couple of years ago. Um, I just wanted to see what their response will be. I gave each one of them, my two boys, my daughter wasn't around yet, I gave each one of them 10 rand and I said, go choose yourself a sweet. Now I knew they had no concept of money. But I just wanted to see what they're going to do. I gave them, they thought, oh, wow, I've got money. And they run to the shelf and they grab the biggest packet that they can find. And it was like 20 rand a packet or 30 rand a packet. I said, ah, but it's not going to work because you don't have the money you can choose on this shelf. I had to show them. I had to educate them as to what they could afford. But what this revealed to me, I'm going to give the point now, is as human beings, we need to be shown, we need to be taught what is the right thing. What the right thing is does not come naturally. Our natural tendency is to want the biggest, to want the best for the, when we can't afford it. That's our natural tendency. 
We are born with sin in us. And sin makes us think sinfully our whole lives. And we think, how are we ever going to have freedom from this when we grew up with this? And we read as well in Romans 5, verse 12 to 14, it says, Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man, in this way death spread to all men because all sinned. Then it says, in fact, sin was in the world before the law. So before God gave his word, there was sin. Before God gave us his written word through Moses, there was sin. Sin has been around since Adam's fall. But sin is not charged to a person's account. And we'll talk a little bit about settling accounts later on. But just let it sit in the back of your mind. Sin was not charged to the account um, when there is no law. Nevertheless, nevertheless, even though there was no law but there was sin, death reigned. From Adam to Moses. And this highlights the point. It shows a couple of things. From Adam to Moses, we read, your people lived many, many years. They got old, like really, really old. But besides for that, we also read that there was sin. I mean, I think it was Judah who slept with his daughter-in-law thinking she's a prostitute. That's just one of the many instances of sin that took place. I mean, that's crazy. Some of the stuff that happened in those patriarchal times, it's madness. Even today we'd look down on it. Yet God used them. So it shows us two things. A, that yes, there's provisional grace before there's law. God established his people before he gave them his law. God establishes us as his children while we are in our sin. We're established. The nation Israel was chosen by God before the law of Moses was introduced. They were established before there was law. So we, in our sinful conditions, yes, we are established. But what else do we see? That even though they did not know the law, the consequence of sin still weighed upon them. They all died. The consequence, the wages of sin is death. They could not escape the consequence of sin. Make sense? So we can, we can be established as God's children, but we must never expect to have the consequences of sin removed from our lives. It's very important to understand. And we need freedom from this. And we see that Romans 6 verse 6 to 7. For we know that our old self was crucified with him. And here's the important one. In order that sin's dominion over the body would be abolished. That's key. Sin's dominion over the body has been abolished. My body no longer has to commit sin because of the finished work of Christ on the cross. Because Christ has paid for my sins on the cross and I've been crucified with Him, my body no longer has to sin. I now have freedom from sin. That means when I live a holy life as God has called me to live a holy life, I no longer have to, have to experience the consequences of sin in my life. I can start experiencing something else. But now ultimately it's our choices. What are we going to submit ourselves to? How are we going to choose to live then? As Christ has called us to live, be holy as your Father in heaven is holy, be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. Or are we still going to choose to live in our former way of life? And it carries on. So that we may no longer be enslaved to sin. Because sin is now abolished in our bodies, we no longer have to commit sin. We are no longer slaves of sin. So is there freedom from our predisposed condition to sin? Yes. The work of Christ, what we celebrated this morning when we took communion, is truly sufficient. The blood of Christ, 
Him giving up His body has made it able for each and every one of us to live free from sin. We can experience a different quality of life because of what Jesus has done on the cross for us. We are free. Then the next one I want to talk about is freedom from self. Freedom from ourselves. And the reason that I talk about this is because so oftentimes we define ourselves by our behavior, by our feelings, by our pasts, by our upbringing, by our family, by, you know, there's various things that we go through and that we feel inside that we say, this is us, this is who I am. And so many times, and I'm going to use the example of patience, like so many times a person will be impatient and they lose their temper quickly and then when they kind of asked about it, when you say, hey, bro, but we should be a bit more patient, so I'm like, oh, that's just the way I am. My grandfather was impatient, my father was impatient, I'm impatient. I was born that way. It's my predisposition. But thank goodness Christ has died so we can move from a predisposition to sin to a new position in Him, free from sin. We have got freedom from ourselves. Freedom from the excuses we hold on to for our sin. I'm just a human being. Yes, think about it. You're a human being. How many times aren't we conditioned by that saying, a leopard can't change its spots? I agree, a leopard can't change its spots, but I'm not a leopard. I'm a human being. God has given me the will and the desire to live differently. I can change. You can't teach an old dog new tricks. I, I know that. I've got an old dog. There's certain things I see. He still doesn't stop begging. No matter what motivation I try to use. But I'm not an old dog. I'm a human being created in the image of the Almighty God. Who's got the ability to change. I'm not defined by what's going on here. I'm defined by the cross of Christ. We are free. Ezekiel 18 verse 20 to 21. This is a verse that I often read to parents um, who feel that their child has turned out a certain way because, oh, what did I do wrong as a parent? But on the flip side, it's also a scripture that I share with Young people who tend to blame their parents. And I'll, I'll explain a scenario. I remember one person had gone through a sequestration. They were broke. It wasn't going well with them. They were really, really struggling. And I was like, kind of, well, what's the problem? Like, what do you think is holding you back? No, no, no. My grandfather was a Freemason and his table is standing in our kitchen. We've got to get rid of his table. And I was kind of like, Ugh. Okay, I understand that what he did was wrong, what he stood for was wrong, and the representation of everything that he did is wrong. I agree with it. I don't disagree with that. But what does the Word of God say? The Word of God says in Ezekiel uh, 18, verse 20 to 21, the person who sins is the person who will die. The son won't suffer punishment for the father's iniquity, and a father won't suffer punishment for the son's iniquity. The righteousness of the righteous person will be on him and the wickedness of the wicked person will be on him. Where does the responsibility lie? Yeah. It's not what I've been raised like. It's not where I come from. It's about who am I before the living God. And how do I decide to live as a child of the living God? Because it carries on. And it says, 
Now, if the wicked person turns from all the sins he has committed, keeps all my statutes, and does what is just and right, he will not die. It goes about a willingness to repent. It goes about a willingness to turn away from that which we know is wrong. And to start doing that which we know is right. We have freedom from self. We have freedom from that preconditioned idea of who we think we are into who God says we are. There's freedom in Christ. The next verse I want to share with you is 2 Corinthians 5 verse 17. And it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Totally new. There might be memories of the old man, but here stands a new man. Someone who God has, has brought back into the image of the son he loves. brought back into what he originally created us to be and i'll talk about that a little bit later on so old things have passed away and look new things have come so we can now walk in a new way of life we can now walk in the way that god has called each and every one of us to walk and then the next thing that i want to share with you is freedom from our circumstances and what i mean by freedom of our circumstances is freedom from having our circumstances control us because yes, oftentimes we end up in circumstances, sometimes circumstances that we never chose. But how those circumstances affect us is still our choice. And God has given us the freedom and the ability and the willpower and the desire and the drive. So many abundant gifts have been poured into our lives that enable us and empower us to, over time, change our circumstances. It's something I've seen time and time and time and time again in my own life and in the lives of a lot of people that I've worked with, when they could click this principle, this one principle, they got freedom from so much oppression in their lives. And that is that your external environment should never influence your internal person. Rather, your internal person should influence your external environment. Rather, it is what is going on inside of you should have an impact on what's happening outside of you. Rather than what's happening outside of you messing you up on the inside. Because that's when you get pressed down by your circumstances. That's where your circumstances overrule you, is where you give over control to your circumstances instead of accepting the control that Christ has given you. And the verse I want to share there, one of the verses is Genesis 1, verse 27 to 28. And I want to explain a little story to you there. It says, so God created man in his own image. He created him in the image of God. He created them, male and female. God blessed them, be fruitful and multiply. Fill the earth and subdue. Another word that could be used there is conquer. Be victorious in it ruled the fish of the sea and as we can see there by the way you can carry on reading but as we can see there god hasn't called us to rule over each other he's called us to rule over the creation that's around us not people it's a very very important point because oftentimes we want to control every aspect of the people's lives around us and that's not the will of god but the will of God is that you take control of your circumstances and your environment and that you conquer, you overcome, you have victory in them. And the story I like sharing is I started smoking at a very, very young age and as we've read in Ezekiel, mom, it's not your fault. Okay? We read that in Ezekiel. I was just a naughty boy. Okay, but I started smoking at a very, very young age and when I was, I think, 26... Uh, I made a girl pregnant 
And at the time, I was still smoking. Um, and I'd smoke about 20 to 30 cigarettes a day. And I was sitting and I knew now, okay, cool, I've got to change my life. And I've heard and seen how Jesus has changed because we did grow up very Christian. So I knew that there was authority in Christ to help me change. So I started reading the Bible from a totally neutral point of view. I didn't read it as a Christian and I also didn't read it as a heathen. I read it with an open mind because I really just wanted to learn. And while I was reading this part in Genesis, I was smoking a cigarette. And I wanted to stop smoking because I wanted my child to grow up with one parent at least who didn't smoke. Because then he's got a 50-50 chance at health. Okay? So I was sitting there and I'm smoking and next thing, and I know it's the Spirit just said, yeah, within me, what is tobacco? It's a plant. And yeah, God's saying you should take control of these created things, is he not? And I was like, yes. So I looked at the cigarette and I said, you do not have control over me. I have control over you. I put the cigarette out and I put my box of cigarettes on the table. Now, no, I, was, I knew about Christ, but I hadn't truly committed my entire life to him at this point yet. But every time I craved the cigarette, I walked up to that box and I said, you do not have control over me. I have control over you. And I'd walk away. And when I was at work, I'd go to one of my friends and say, Hey, but you got a cigarette for me. He goes, Yeah, I say, Shop. As he gives it, You do not have control of me. I have control of you. And I'd give him back his cigarette and say, Shot. But in that moment, I learned the power of Christ in circumstance. Because until today, I don't smoke. And that's by the grace of God. That's by a simple application of what is written in God's Word. Taking one verse and deciding to apply it to my life in my circumstances. And then we have victory. You see, our victory is in Christ completely. Because the next verse puts it very well as well. 1 John 4 verse 4. You are from God, little children. And you have conquered them because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. You have the almighty, all-powerful, all-knowing God dwelling in you when you believe in Christ. Everything needed for your life is here. Because the almighty God has gone and put it there. And it's not because we're great. It's not because we're fantastic. It's not because we're clever. But it's because we've got a living God who loves us. And he loves us so much that he gave his son to die for us. So that we could experience freedom. And are we going to live in that freedom? You see, I've got a little philosophy I'd like to share with you. And Jim, if you'd be so kind, you can push enter probably about six to seven times. Um, and I've gotten him to give everything. Normally I'd break it down bit for bit, but it's easier if it's there, then I can just talk because I don't have... God's decided to take my control away. <laughs> so, originally, that the fall of man we can see as a timeline. How things took place over time. And I label this naturally supernatural. Because we, as Christians, and this is the sad thing, see spirituality and supernatural living as something out there that's difficult to attain. But God originally created us in His image. That's our true nature. Our normal nature in God's eyes is supernatural. What is supernatural to us is totally natural to God. We fell. We sinned. We became less than what we were intended to be. We fell from grace. Then God provided Christ. When we accept Christ, the Holy Spirit comes and dwells in us again and we become again. We are above the fall. We become a back into our restored Christly image. We walk back into our true nature. 
Now, some people uh, twist this principle a little bit. And I say, oh, cool, we like we were originally supposed to be in the Garden of Eden. We're never going to die. No rubbish. It is given to man once to live and once to die. And then the judgment. That's never going to change. This body of mine, this body of all of ours, our physical flesh, has committed sin. And the wages of sin is? So we've got to die. There's no question about that. But I have been restored to my natural image in Christ. That means going forward, I no longer have to sin. Will I still sin? Probably. But am I free from that sin? Yes. I don't have to do it. You see the difference? The problem is we might just not know quite what right and wrong is yet. You know, there's different ways of interpreting things. And scripture says, as a man thinks within himself, so is he. So how you choose to interpret things is going to determine how you experience this world. It's just the way it is. And some people say, God has forgiven my sin yesterday, today, and forevermore. So man, let's have a party tonight because I'm forgiven. Let's get debaucherously drunk. Because you know what my future sins are? That's how some people interpret that. And it's sad because they never experience the freedom from sin that Christ has purchased for them. Whereas there's a different way of seeing it. If my future sins are forgiven, that means I don't have to commit them because they've been wiped away. They've been cleansed by the blood of Christ. So I don't have to sin anymore. And we can click on to the next slide. And it's kind of like having your debt settled at the bank. Imagine you sit there, you've got a million rands debt. And your uh, uh, installment every single month to the bank has got to be 10,000 rand. And every month you've got to take 10,000 rand of the money that you've gone and earned. And you've got to go pay the bank because you owe them a million. And a good Samaritan sees this burden that you are under. And that good Samaritan looks at you and they say, I don't want you to be under that burden anymore. And they go settle that debt that you have at the bank. So you square. You don't owe anything. Are you going to go back to the bank at the end of the month and pay them their 10,000 rand? Why not? Because the debt's been settled. In fact, people will look at you if you do that and say, are you mad, bro? What's wrong with you? Why are you paying a debt that's already been settled? You don't have to pay the bank. Yet, is that not what we do as human beings? The debt's been settled by Christ. We don't have to sin. We're free from it. Yet, every day, we go and walk to the bank, and we pay a debt that's already been settled. Scary, but true. And that's what I want us to see when I talk about slaves of freedom. That we don't, we're not slaves of sin, but if we want to live in freedom, we need to make ourselves, in our own hearts and in our own minds, slaves of the freedom that Christ has purchased us. Instead of saying, I'm impatient, that's just the way I am. Would it not be better to say, I am patient, that's just the way I am. I am loving, that's just the way I am. Because Christ has bought this for us. As William Barclay said, Christian freedom does not mean being free to do as we like. It means being free to do as we ought to do. We are now free to do what God has called us to do. So let's do it. And now I just want to get us into, and I've got it on the next thing, some steps, some process, what we can get into, living in Christian freedom. And I draw this from 2, uh, 2 Peter 1 verse 3 to 11. And again, you can click, click them all and then I'll just talk. Uh, one, there we go. Thank that uh, one back. 
Bah, there we go. Thank you. Number one, it talks about we should uh, have our faith, remain faithful. And faith is not too much of a complicated thing. Trust God. Believe what He says is in, in His Word is true and obey it. That's remaining faithful. It's not a complicated thing. Just trust and believe and do. That's all. The next one that we got there is develop goodness. And goodness I see as integrity. A good person, someone who's good, has a good heart, reflects a good heart. We, we ask that question often, what is integrity? And people say it, uh, the nine times out of ten, the generic answer, doing the right thing even when no one is looking. Yes, that is integrity, but in my mind it's more a fruit of integrity than integrity itself. Integrity means to be whole, to be complete, oneness. In human living, in human terms, it means spirit, soul, and body are all in alignment. So the Holy Spirit is within me. My mind and heart are fixed on the will of God, and my body does what God says I must do. Then we are living with integrity. Then we are good in the eyes of the Lord. Make sense? But it's something we're going to have to work on. It's not something that just comes naturally as we slaves of sin. We've got to learn the right thing. So develop it. Next one, we can develop it by growing in knowledge. The more and more we know, the more we release the ability to do. You see, the go between our spirits and our body is our soul. And the key is the mind. And it's not just about growing in knowledge about everyday things, specifically growing in knowledge in biblical truth. The Word of God is truth. In this world that we live in, it's so clouded. I mean, there's so many opinions between what is right and what is wrong. So, even in the church, there's all of the gray areas. But you as an individual believer, don't just sit and listen to the message that's being given here to you and take my word for it. Be like the Bereans in Acts. Go and study what I tell you myself. Go and study what Pastor Brad teaches. Resolve it within your own heart and mind. Go and make sure that you are being filled with biblical truth. And then when you do, once you've got that knowledge, it goes about exercising self-control. I know my personal downfall is food. I battle with it. I love it. That's why I'm a plus-size model. <laughs> and uh, my wife suffers from the same thing when it comes to cake. Mine's hamburgers and pizzas. My wife's cake. You know, I know in my head... I've got to eat chicken, broccoli, brown, this. I know exactly what I've got to eat. But when I see that slice of pizza, <laughs> and without self-control, and without exercising self-control in the little things, I'm always going to eat it. So once you've got the knowledge of what it is to be good, exercise self-control. Tomorrow you can maybe say no to that pizza once and then have slice number two. You know? And then slice number three, you can hold off to slice number three. You get what I'm saying? But eventually you develop self-control. Next point is patiently persist. Don't give up. Never, ever, 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 ever give up. I remember when I was, I was trying to be an insurance broker at a stage in my life, selling short-term insurance. And I remember as a kid I saw this image. I don't know if any of you have had it where that stalk had a frog in its mouth. And the frog's sitting there like this, strangling the... And it says, never give up. And the frog strangling that. I saw a different picture and I actually drew it out and stuck it on my cubicle when I was trying to be an insurance broker. The frog sitting on top of the stalk with a big smile on his face. And the stalk's got dead eyes, but he's still strangling. And it says, I told you, never give up. Christianity and living for Christ is probably the most difficult discipline that you will ever engage in. 
being a true disciple of Jesus Christ is hard. When asked about addiction and drugs and all that, I mean, I started taking drugs at a young age as well. And when asked about it, I tell people stopping drugs was easy. That's like choosing between brown bread, white bread, or no bread. It's a choice. What's difficult is following Jesus every single day of my life. But if I follow Jesus, I naturally stay clean. Follow Jesus and you'll naturally do the right thing. But patiently persist. We have got victory in Christ. And then the next point is make godliness your goal. And what I mean by godliness, have God foremost in your mind. To be godly means to be with God. As scripture teaches us, meditate about Him. Meditate on His Word day and night. Think foremost about God and make godliness your goal. And we can move on to practice affection and that's community. Yeah, in the community as we are in the church, when you see someone is downhearted, be concerned. As scripture teaches us, uh, uh, mourn with those who mourn and celebrate with those who celebrate. I'm paraphrasing. Ne? But get involved, get stuck in, become a part of the community. But then it's got to stretch beyond our community as well of believers. And make a commitment to live out love. Every single human being that you meet is another opportunity to shine love and light into those people's lives. We are the light of this world. And I think the brightest light that we can shine on this earth is the light of love. Because God is love. God is love. And to illustrate these steps in action, I'd like to tell you about the journey of uh, uh, Joseph and what he went through. Because he's someone who really could have given in. And when, when I read about the, the Old Testament guys, you can click on to the, the next slide. When, and you'll read about him in Genesis uh, 37 to 46. Whenever I read about the Old Testament guys and what they overcame, I have a great deal of respect for them. In fact, I've oftentimes more respect for the Old Testament guys than what I do sometimes for the New Testament guys, and I'll explain why. Because in the Old Testament, they didn't have the Spirit of Christ like we have Him today. That was pure, just people loving God, if you get what I'm saying. We're in a much different disposition today. We have the Spirit of the Almighty God dwelling in us. And here you've got this example of Joseph. I mean, this guy suffered a great deal. First, he's taken by his own brothers and he's thrown into a pit and sold off into slavery into a foreign country. Then in the foreign country, he's accused and falsely thrown into prison for attempted rape, something he didn't do. Potiphar's wife. Then he has to sit in prison for a couple of years before he experiences his freedom. Think about the struggles that he had to overcome. If that happened to me, if I got sold into slavery, I'd go crawl under a rock and want to die. I'd go hide under a tree for weeks and I'd be, no, Lord, I can't believe this. Think of the hatred that Joseph had to overcome towards his brothers. Think of the fear of being in a, in a foreign country. He had countless challenges that he had to overcome, but what was his attitude? Was his attitude just to cower and hide and say that life is unfair? Poor me? No, where he was found, he was diligent. In Potiphar's house, he worked so hard that he was in charge of Potiphar's entire house. He overcame temptation. He overcame self. How did he do that? I mean, think about us as men. It, it would have been so easy for Joseph just to sleep with Potiphar's wife. Because he was probably burning with desire like most of us men do. But he chose to resist it. 
He chose to step back and say, no, I'm not going to do that. And when he was in prison, he dedicated himself to work there in the prison. Irrespective of his circumstances, to the point that the warden did nothing in the prison. Everything was left over to Joseph. He was someone who shows us what it is, irrespective of self. Irrespective of circumstances. Irrespective of sin. To walk. As God has called us to walk. And how do we know that? As Keith highlighted last week when he spoke about Joseph. What's his first response when he stands in front of Pharaoh? I can't interpret your dreams. But my Lord can. And my Lord will. How did he get through all of that? How did he experience and walk in this freedom? God was foremost in his knowledge. It was all about God. He did things for God's glory. He was a slave to God. He was a slave to Christ. And in the same way we can walk in freedom. When we make ourselves slaves to Christ. When you're a slave to Christ. You're a slave to freedom. So we're all sitting with a choice. We can click on to the next slide. Either life or death. As we read in Deuteronomy, I put these two before you, life and death. Choose life so that you and your descendants might live. And we always sit with that choice. And while we meditate on that choice, I want to leave you with the words of Jesus as we read them in John 8. And John 8 verse 34 says, Jesus responded, I assure you, everyone who commits sin is a slave of sin. Words of Christ. And the wages of sin is, just because you are called, just because you are redeemed, and just because you are established by God, do not for one minute think that the consequences of sin are going to overpass you. If you choose to live in sin, the consequences of your sin are going to catch you. It's the way it is. Or you can choose life. And two verses on, we read Jesus saying again, in verse 36, Therefore, if the Son sets you free, you are truly free indeed. You want to live in freedom? Live for Christ. And as a closing thought, while the band comes up to play the final song, I want to read you this one verse. And that's Galatians 5 verse 16 to 18. It says, I say then, walk by the Spirit and you will not carry out the desires of the flesh. For the flesh desires what is against the Spirit, and the Spirit desires what is against the flesh. These are opposed to each other so that you don't do what you want. But if you are led by the Spirit, you are not under the law. And he has the thing, think about it. Leave this as a closing thought in your hearts and your minds as you go out. Don't you oftentimes find that when you are doing the wrong thing, your heart says, I wish I was doing the right thing? And don't you also oftentimes find when you are doing the right thing, your heart says, ooh, I wish I was doing the wrong thing. Which person do you want to be? Because that struggle is always going to be within us. We're always going to have that battle. Whether we're doing the right thing or the wrong thing. If we do the wrong thing on conscience, our conscience is going to bug us. And if we're doing the right thing, our sinful nature is going to bug us. But rather be that person who does the right thing. And let your sinful nature die, as Christ has called it, to die. Father God, I just thank you for the privilege to share your word, Lord. I pray, Lord, that you will just open our hearts and minds. And if there's anything in any one of us that you would like us to lay down at your cross, Lord, I pray that you will give us the confidence to know that we are truly free in you. 
In you we have true freedom, Lord. And I pray that you will give each and every one of us the confidence and the zeal to walk in the freedom that you have purchased for us. And that we will commit ourselves to living out your word in this world. Amen.